Hello and welcome to Overdrive. This is Rohit Paratkar. We are back online with a news roundup for this week. This is something that we tried last week as well. Now this is week number eight for us, uh, where we are still working from home, still waiting to go out there and drive. Uh, but the good news is that the automotive industry has started rebooting itself uh, in India and also around the world. And this week we had two launches uh, take place, two launch functions take place rather. And both of them were digital launch functions and both of them went uh, quite nicely. Uh, so Skoda did it from uh, their home back in uh, uh, Mother Bolislav. And uh, then we also had Mercedes-Benz India doing it from their plant in Chakan. So uh, that is what we are going to dive into right away. Uh, so this, like I said, is going to be a news roundup. A little while later, Bert will also join us. And during this presentation, where we go through the news that happened all through the week, if you have any questions, start posting them so that we can start interacting, we can start answering them as well. So diving right in, the first launch uh, that happened this week uh, was that of the Skoda Rapid. Now, the Rapid has been sort of repositioned a little bit. Uh, it had uh, started at 6.99 lakh, if I'm uh, not wrong, earlier. And now it is about 7.49 lakh. But the big news is what you see right on the screen, the new 1-liter TSI engine. Uh, sorry, the 1.5 TSI engine. Now, uh, Skoda and Volkswagen have been uh, going big with... Uh, the TSI engines, uh, okay, there's a little bit of a confusion there, right? So the rapid TSI that you can see on the screen is the one liter TSI. It's a three cylinder engine. It's something that we've seen in the TSI editions of uh, the Polo and the Vento as well. And it starts at a brilliant price of 7.49 lakh. Like I said, the previous one uh, was at 6.99. 7.49 is about 50,000 more, but it offers a lot more value because this engine uh, is actually more powerful than uh, the 1.6 liter model that it replaces. It gets 110 PS of power, uh, gets about 175 Newton meters of torque. So these are healthy figures. So even if it's a one liter three cylinder engine with all that turbocharging, it is at least on paper, uh, something that you can look forward to if, you're, uh, if you've been looking at shopping in this particular space, because like I said, the pricing is now really nice. Uh, so it goes up against the recently launched Hyundai Verna. It will also go up against the upcoming new Honda City. And then there is the big rival from Maruti Suzuki, which is the Sierra, which comes with the smart hybrid. Uh, just to uh, quickly refresh your memory, there is no diesel for the Maruti Suzuki Sierra anymore. And it's the same route that even Skoda is taking. No diesel for the Rapid anymore. It's this one liter TSI that they will go with. Now, why I jumbled up with the 1.5 TSI is because of the other launch that Skoda did. But before we come to that, we'll also talk about the superb facelift. Now, the superb facelift has also been launched 29.99 lakh rupees. Uh, now, at the Auto Expo, we did bring you a walk around video of the superb uh, facelifted version. We have detailed all the changes. So head over to the Overdrive YouTube channel and you will be able to take a closer look at what all has changed, what all has been upgraded. Now, at the Auto Expo, they also showed a spec sheet of a diesel motor. And they said that they were still evaluating options. They were still trying to see if the diesel engine can be tuned for BS6 emissions. But unfortunately, it has not happened, at least not as of now. They are only going ahead with a petrol engine. It is, uh, again, a two liter petrol. Uh, it comes in two uh, trim levels, Sportline and LNK. LNK being the top of the line, the Sportline being the slightly sportier one. So there is a difference in uh, the accents and the various inlays and all of that. So again, I urge you to take a look at the walk around video that we did at the Auto Expo where we have shown both these cars. Uh, so you'll get a brief idea of what the two look like. Uh, now the engine, it puts out 190 PS of power, 320 Newton meters of torque, which is again, uh, slightly higher than the outgoing car. It's made it to a seven speed dual flush transmission. And for a, uh, for a petrol engine, it claims a decent fuel economy of 15.1 kilometers to a liter. Like I said, Skoda has taken the no diesel route. So there is no diesel option. Now, the diesel was one of the more popular variants uh, for the Superb. In fact, when we did uh, a comparison against the Camry Hybrid, we were trying to sort of compare what are the figures that the Camry Hybrid manages versus uh, the range that the diesel Superb manages. And a lot of you didn't really like that idea, but now these are the only options. So compared to the Camry Hybrid, yes, these uh, uh, fuel efficiency figures are lesser. But Skoda says that this particular segment, the buyer is not that concerned about uh, fuel economy or range. Uh, is that true or not is something that only you can tell us. So if there are any questions, uh, what you feel about this uh, no diesel strategy from Skoda is something that you can tell me about. Uh, so do use the comment section on whatever platform you're consuming this video on and let us know what you think. Now, the third big launch from Skoda on that day was the Karok, a very, very awaited vehicle. We've been talking about it for a long time now. It is the spiritual successor to the Yeti. 
Now, does it really uh, qualify as a successor to the Yeti? I don't know. Till I drive both the cars back to back, I don't know. I'm a big fan of the Yeti. I'm a big fan of the capabilities of the Yeti. And I know there are many out there who uh, sort of resonate with that idea. It was one of the best road trip vehicles that you could buy under 25 lakh rupees with the kind of kit that it came with and all of that. And it was lovely. Now, the Karok, you do not have multiple options to choose from. There's only one trim level and this gets the 1.5 TSI motor. Again, no diesel engine. Uh, just to refresh uh, your memory again, Skoda is going with a no diesel route. There's a 1.5 TSI. It comes with a cylinder deactivation technology as well. So if you're cruising down the highway, it can close half the cylinders so that you can improve on the fuel economy and on the range. Does it still make it a great road trip vehicle? Like I said, till I drive the car, I can't comment on that. But in terms of uh, the specs, uh, well, uh, it is a 150 PS engine, 250 Newton meters of torque. The 250 Newton meters of torque is also dialed in quite early. So that is a nice thing. We'll come to a spec comparison in a bit, but there's no all wheel drive option, which again, sort of makes me miss the Yeti. The Yeti was the do it all vehicle. It had everything, a beautiful diesel engine. It had the four by four on all wheel drive capability on all of that. And it was just perfect for road tripping. The kind of uh, design it had, the kind of space it offered, the kind of driving dynamics that it offered despite its size. It was just beautiful. And that's something that the Karok will have to uh, go up against in my books at least. And that is something that I'm uh, waiting to find out when I drive the car. Now, like I said, let's uh, quickly also take a look at uh, a spec comparison between the Karok and its immediate rivals. Uh, there you have it on the screen. So the Karok now uh, goes up against the Volkswagen T-Roc, which was launched just before we went into the lockdown. There's also the Jeep Compass, uh, which continues to be a very strong rival. And there is the Hyundai Tucson. I'm going to keep hopping on this. There is no diesel option for the Karok. So essentially, it goes up against the petrol variants of the Compass and the Tucson. And if you look at uh, the screen right in front of you, what's marked in blue is essentially uh, the strong point or the best in class capability of that particular vehicle. So if you look at the Tucson, the size is the largest. The Tucson is still the largest vehicle in its class. There is an updated vehicle coming very soon. It was shown at the Auto Expo. Uh, so there is the facelifted uh, Tucson that will come out very soon with a host of new feature upgrades and all of that. Uh, but even the current Tucson is very feature packed. Now, of course, the Karok being the newest entrant and also the T-Rock, these two will sort of uh, take the cake when it comes to the features, when, when it comes to the kind of ambience that they create inside the cabin with that uh, virtual cockpit and all of that. And I think it looks beautiful. Uh, if we can just go back to the previous screen, I'm uh, going to quickly point a few things uh, more to you, uh, more for you. Now, Skoda is essentially harping on the big boot space. If, if any one of you uh, witnessed that launch, uh, the online launch that happened, Skoda is constantly pointing out to the big boot space. Yes, it is the best in class boot space. And that is something that they are using to uh, sort of uh, market or uh, sort of uh, show their upper hand over the competition. Now, will a boot space be the only thing that matters? I don't know. Yes, from a road tripping point of view, of course, but not that the other cars have a very tiny boot space or anything. So just talking about the 521 liters, I'm not sure uh, about it. But it's also the lightest car in its class. At 1320 kilos, it is lighter than uh, anything else, including its own sibling. Fuel economy, again, it's claimed at about 14.49 kilometers to a liter. The T-Roc hasn't made any claims, but that 14.49, as far as claimed fuel economy figures goes, uh, is the best in class. And uh, with my experience of the Tucson and the Jeep Compass, I can sort of vouch for it. I think the Caro could actually be the best in class when it comes to fuel economy. The Compass petrol is terrible on fuel economy. If you are going to be using it as your daily driver, I am completely against it. In the city, the fuel economy of the Compass petrol is just terrible. The Compass diesel is the one to go for. Even with the Tucson, with the automatic, the petrol engine just doesn't return a great fuel economy. So if fuel economy is still going to be a very important factor for you, you will have to look at the Compass or the Tucson and its diesel variants. The Karok and the T-Roc are clearly out of, uh, out of the consideration here. But if fuel economy is not that big a concern, then yes, the Karok and the T-Roc are in the picture. They'll probably be the, the best uh, offerings in the, in the space when it comes to the ambience, when it comes to the look and feel, when it comes to getting closer to those entry-level German compacts. These are the cars that are going to take you very close to that without the big badge of an Audi or a BMW or a Mercedes attached with it. So uh, this, is, uh, this is the way to look at these cars, really. If you are looking at a more cost-effective alternative to uh, the entry-level compacts from the luxury brands, these two cars make a lot of sense. And I think that is where the Caro fits right in. But for the pricing, let's move to the next uh, slide where uh, we'll talk about the pricing of uh, these four vehicles. If you look at the pricing, 
on road price for mumbai for the car rock is 29.67 lakh rupees now like i said there's only one trim to choose from there's only one variant to choose from so there's no high or low or anything of that sort there's only one variant uh, same for uh, the t rock as well there are only one variant to choose from and 29.67 lakh rupees can actually get you a decently spec jeep compass diesel so if you are still looking at a road tripping vehicle if you're still looking for an adventure vehicle the compass could still make a better uh, proposition overall same with the two saw you, uh, you have diesel options within the two saw two wheel drive four wheel drive you have all of that so if you are into adventure touring if you are into a lot of road tripping if you want uh, necessarily a four wheel drive or all wheel drive there are these options and then you have the massive range that the diesel will uh, come with so yes the caro doesn't have uh, an easy uh, Uh, no easy pickings for uh, the car rock but uh, yeah i mean it's a, it's a nice uh, move from skoda uh, the kodiak has done uh, pretty well uh, with uh, whatever it has to offer with the kind of price tag that it comes at uh, with great competition like the fortuner and uh, the endeavor to fend off the kodiak has still done quite well and skoda hopes to repeat that success uh, with the car rock as well and that is something uh, that we hope to see as well but like i said it's the yeti that it has to beat in my book so the moment i drive the car i'll be able to tell you whether it does that or not for me uh, so moving on to the next piece of news uh hi bert okay so yeah bert is also here hi bert hi so, bert uh, hi Hello, i don't everybody. know if you if you caught the live uh, i got the last bit of it uh, with so karok uh, you were discussing the merits uh, the pros yes. and cons of the karok uh, spec comparison against its competitors in the segment in the uh, so i i think i'm not sure if you brought that up but i think that one of the uh, salient features for the karok the one benefit that the karok has and the reason why it could probably do well in fuel efficiency for instance is also because of the cylinder deactivation the cylinder deactivation uh, feature that it's got so you know instead of running on all four cylinders it can run on two cylinders and right. that is expected to be where the better mileage uh, can come up compared to the others in that category uh, right that's one of the reasons where the jeep compass falters also because the power right. to weight ratio it's in the jeep compass is a fairly heavy vehicle uh True. and uh, while the power ratings are not bad uh, all, all, all around it still tells on the fuel efficiency of that vehicle so right. yeah that's that's i think one of the uh, one of the shortcomings for the compass and maybe an advantage in favor of the karok but yeah right. going but on i think the i think the biggest uh, the biggest worry factor for uh, the karok is going to be the price tag at about 29.67 lakh on road yes uh, is, you can still expensive. end up uh, getting a, a a a compass diesel or even a two saw diesel uh, for that price Uh, which could be quite well catered uh, as well. The, not the T-Roc diesel, of course. The diesel may not come in the T-Roc. We'll talk about that again. Uh, right. There may be a plan for that in the future. But uh, the T-Roc, just if you have to take an example of the T-Roc uh, as competitor, keep in mind both the same platform. Uh, you know, just uh, how do I say, badge, not badge engineering, but a lot of differences, of course, between the Carrot and the T-Roc and the T-Roc. But right. uh, still, nonetheless, uh, you know, uh, Volkswagen are going to manage to price it uh, fairly aggressively. Right. Uh, and uh, where uh, Skoda is leading on with this strategy now, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, also, keep in mind that uh, the uh, Karok at this point in time is a CBU, uh, so it's not uh, manufactured here in India as yet. So, right. being a CBU, the taxes, of course, are going to be higher. And still, Skoda has done a fairly good job in that sense to kind of keep them under control. Right. So I think overall, uh, not too bad, but I think Skoda could have been a bit more aggressive. Then. Right. So moving on to the next uh, the next launch that happened uh, in this week, uh, which was from Mercedes Benz. Two cars, in fact, launched uh, by Mercedes Benz. Uh, there was the C sixty three AMG and of course uh, the GTR. Uh, now you did a live session uh, with both these cars, uh, yes. Bert, uh, and uh, also witnessed the live launch. And we have also witnessed these cars in the past, on the facelifted versions, of course, but we witnessed them in their uh, in their pre facelift versions let's put it that way so essentially the same platform uh, the same engine the same performance and both literally uh, some of the best that the amg uh, brand has to offer they are at the pinnacle of performance uh, the the gtr is of course uh, the the flagship for the brand and then there is uh, also uh, then there is also the c63 amg which is easily one of the best performance sedans out there right now from germany is uh okay so yeah yeah definitely is i mean these are two great examples of what the mg brand has to offer uh one the c63 which is the very epitome of a fantastic sedan that you would want to own uh of course now instead of the four door sedan uh, we are getting the coupe uh, which makes it a little more sexy a little hotter in that sense you know which are, you, if you look at that form i mean look at that video clip right there and look at that form it is that silhouette is just 
brilliant. The profiles are just brilliant. So yes, it looks it looks nice. It still has got that angry look around it, uh, especially thanks to that front grille of and uh, those large uh, you know the large bumpers, the front bumpers, the big uh, intakes. So there is that aggression. There is that hint of aggression. Uh, what I'm very interested in uh, knowing is just how good this car sounds because let's keep it in mind. C63 used to be the benchmark for you know fantastic sounding European muscle cars. There wasn't a car uh, of that order that actually sounded as good as it did. So the, the you know the M5 or take the Porsches for that matter uh, or even what Audi had to offer the RS. Uh, nothing really sounds comes close to where this car sounds. So in that regard, uh, the C63 is an absolute beast, an absolute monster. Uh, the GTR, on the other hand, I mean, fantastic car as well, great dynamics. I had the opportunity to drive it quite some years ago at Laguna Seca, and it was it was phenomenal. I mean, uh, what a mind blowing car! Uh, and and it's nice to see that uh, this, the brand that has brought this car back again into India, of course, the new avatar that it is in. And from what I understand, is that the first car, in fact, that they showcased at uh, the time of the launch, they, they showed that the time of the launch. Uh, has already been sold out. So yeah, I mean, uh, while there is uh, the rest of the world is uh, facing economic challenges, there definitely exists a class that can uh, you know buy uh, into these kind of cars, which is also a good thing. Let's not uh, you know let's not put that down because uh, uh, it's the rich also that will kind of you know in a sense uh, turn the economy around and uh, get um, money into people's pockets by spending more and more on some cars like this. Yeah, right. So there you go. There's those are those clips, fantastic clips of the GTR. Uh, we're hoping uh, you know, to have that story with us soon, as well as uh, the story on the C63. So keep a uh, watch out for that. It'll all be coming out of the magazine. In fact, some of our lucky uh, colleagues are driving that car right now as we sit at home yes. and uh, <laughs> conduct this live session. So, I know. Yeah. I know some of us. Some, yeah, of some of us are lucky to enough to, to do that. But uh, yes, I think I think uh, uh, two fantastic launches uh, there from uh, Mercedes Benz. Uh, and again, continuing from uh, you know the German luxury uh, trio, the BMW 5 Series facelift uh, has been uh, finally revealed. Uh, yes. I saw the car on test in Germany last year uh, yes. in its uh, camouflage and everything. But now the face has finally been revealed uh, as expected. Huge grill again, as expected. The headlamps are uh, sort of uh, drawing uh, design inspiration from uh, the 7 Series uh, sleek units uh, up front. Uh, in, in fact, even the tail lights uh, are quite sleek. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, it is it is looking slightly sleeker uh, with that new face now. Uh, the five series uh, has grown over the years, and the current five series, uh, despite being uh, sportier than its outgoing model, still had a lot of visual bulk. And somehow now this facelift sort of uh, uh, fixes that. I'm glad that the the grill is not as big as I uh, I expected it to be, or as I'm I'm I was really afraid. The series or the, as uh, the, the seven X5, series of the X5 and the X7, yeah. exactly the X5 in particular. After seeing what they did yes. with the X5, I was really scared that I mean, they that might was just do that. To look at absolutely ghastly. Exactly, to look at. and but, uh, uh, here, yes, they've softened it. Uh, it looks a little more elegant. Uh, you know, definitely far more. Uh, how do I say it? Uh, approachable in a way. I mean, you, you're not going to think of this. This is the car that will swallow my kids. So that's not going to happen. So at least in that way, this this looks a lot more softer, a lot more you know uh, acceptable, a lot more approachable. Uh, and of course, the five series has always been a great car to drive. Uh, looking forward to another car. So there's a lot of cars we're looking forward to driving. You know, everything that we come on the news, we're okay, looking forward to driving. So we're looking. We've never been in the situation of you know where we've always said, oh, we're going out to drive it, and now we're looking forward. We're waiting and we're waiting and we're just waiting for this whole cycle to get over so that we can get back to driving these uh, great cars. True. Yeah. So there you have the five series. Uh, what else have we got in news uh, this week, Rohit? I think we are moving on to uh, motorcycles from here. Uh, favorite topic for me as well. So yes, uh, Kawasaki has uh, had uh, two launches this week as well. So last week we to uh, talked about the uh, Versus Thousand and the Ninja Six Fifty, and this time it's again the Six Fifty and the Thousand that are in the news. One is the Z Six Fifty, a street naked. Of course, we already know of that, and the other is the. Uh, 1000SX, the Ninja 1000SX, a brilliant sports tourer. And yet again, uh, Kawasaki has managed to uh, get a get a brilliant price tag uh, with, uh, with both these uh, motorcycles. So let's quickly just play some footage and we'll uh, take a look at the pricing as well.
So the Z650, it continues to use the same uh, engine as before. It is a BS6 uh, compliant tune now. Uh, it's a 649cc engine, parallel twin motor, puts out 68 PS of power and 64 Newton meters of torque. And it's only available in one color as of now, which is the metallic black uh, that I think you see on the screen. I have not seen uh, the actual uh, vehicle, but I think that's the same color that you see on the screen right now is what uh, they are uh, they are going to be selling in the Indian market for, uh, for the coming year. And the other motorcycle, like I said, is uh, the Ninja 1000SX. Uh, now this this is not the Z650. The, what you see on the screen is the Ninja 1000 SX, and uh, yeah, it, even that has been uh, launched at a very very nice price tag. Last time we saw a, a sub 11 lakh rupee price tag for the Versus Thousand as well, and the same for the Ninja 1000 SX as well. 10.79 lakh rupees for this motorcycle is brilliant. This is of course a BS6 uh, compliant uh, engine. Uh, there are quite a few changes uh, that you see uh, in terms of the paint schemes and everything. The exhausts look different now. Uh, there is a bit of new equipment as well. So I think, again, Kawasaki has nailed uh, the pricing uh, with uh, with this motorcycle. So if you are looking at shopping in the in the sport touring space, uh, of course, the world is moving to ADVs and everyone is looking at ADVs and different price brackets. But these uh, sport fairs, uh, these sport tourers still have their own charm. And that is what uh, the Ninja 1000SX brings to the table. Uh, we have uh, written the previous models in the past. They have left us quite excited. The engine is brilliant. The electronics package on it is uh, quite nice too. It sounds quite good. Uh, remember, these are uh, there are very few uh, four-cylinder uh, engine sport tourers that you can buy for this kind of a uh, for for a price. And for yeah, for this price, I think uh, Kawasaki uh, the the Ninja 1000 in its SX form as well is one very good buy but again we will wait till we ride the motorcycle so that we can bring you a more detailed review on the same now moving on to uh one big uh, news that came out uh, which was uh ola ola electric having taken over the e-scooters but before we do that in fact there was one more news uh, that came out uh, uh, that was about the suzuki jixa 250 which is launched now at 1.63 lakh rupees uh, it is a bs6 uh, variant now uh, so if you have been waiting to buy a BS6 uh, Suzuki Jixer, well, there you have it. It's out in the market now. Uh, that was something that uh, Suzuki hadn't confirmed when the BS6 uh, vehicle is going to come out. Uh, we were hoping that it would come out a little before uh, the deadline was uh, was put into effect. But yeah, it's taken a bit of time because of the lockdown and everything. But the BS6 uh, Suzuki SF is finally here. So like I said, the pricing is 1.63 lakh rupees. Uh, the SF250 uh, is 1.74 lakh rupees, which is the fed version that you just saw on the screen. And yeah, I mean, again, good pricing. It is a bit of an increase, uh, about 3,000 rupees over the outgoing BS4 models. But I think that's not a very big premium to pay for the BS4 to BS6 conversion uh, because we have seen uh, bigger hikes uh, in different uh, vehicles and different body styles and all of that. So 3,000 rupees, I think, is not a very very not big bad, change uh, not bad at all yeah because keep in mind also with the bs6 changes uh, price revisions are going to be there and these are going to be upward revisions for whatever technology right. they're coming into these motorcycles so it's going to be a little more expensive at the end of the day and while most manufacturers have tried to absorb that or you know uh, dilute uh, that uh, those price uh, hikes uh they right. still uh, there so i think 3000 is not a bad uh, you know hike at all for that matter for a motorcycle in this category this order uh, moving on from there, uh, I think we've got, uh, uh, yeah, Rohit, uh, Ola, of course, uh, big news. Ola is going to launch uh, an e-scooter uh, by, 20 by 2021. So uh, uh, what, they've, what they've taken over right now, what they've acquired is Etergo. It is, uh, it is a company based out of uh, the Netherlands, uh, hails from Amsterdam. Uh, and they, their claim to fame was the app scooter. Uh, very cute looking yes. scooter, very minimalist design. And uh, that is uh, what the claim to fame was. Uh, and uh, Ola has uh, made a, a, an exciting uh, announcement with that. Now, I'm not sure if uh, the Etergo app scooter is what they will bring to India next year, though it is very likely that uh, that might happen. Uh, but uh, the pricing of this particular scooter in uh, Europe is uh, almost uh, 4,000 euros uh, or 3,300 without the taxes, what I'm told. So with that kind of a price tag, of course, uh, you know, Ola will have to probably localize components, um, you know, to uh, bring a more competitive price tag to the Indian market. So I'm not sure if it's if, if it's this scooter or are they going to use the brains and the, the technology from here and maybe develop something for India. But with a deadline that they've set for themselves, which is 2021, I think uh, developing an all new vehicle uh, would uh, certainly take a lot uh, longer, especially uh, considering that uh, Ola Electric 
doesn't have a product in the market as of now uh, of, of this kind. So uh, it does make sense to bring the scooter, localize it and bring it to India. Uh, but this has a lot of things going for it. Uh, in fact, what you're seeing on the screen right now is a modular swappable battery pack. You can literally remove the batteries and uh, take it uh, take it home for charging. Each battery pack weighs about 7.5 kilos. You can have up to three of these battery packs powering the scooter. And uh, if you were to ride at 20 kilometers an hour, which are uh, basically your bumper-to-bumper uh, -bumper traffic uh, kind of speeds uh, that you uh, you'll, across, you'll come across in metros and city environments, uh, Etergo is saying that you might get 80 kilometers of range from one battery. So if you have these three, they're claiming an outstanding range of 240 kilometers. That's huge. Uh, so if, if we can just quickly look at a spec comparison with uh, the electric uh, scooters that have made the headlines uh, in, the, in the past uh, few months, we have the Bajaj Chetak EV, we have the TVS iCube, uh, we also have the Aether 450X. So there we have it on the screen, a quick uh, spec comparison. Uh, so the Etergo, it has a, a much more powerful uh, electric motor compared to the other vehicles that we've seen. It's on par with uh, what the 450X offers, but 50 Newton meters of torque uh, mm -hmm. from the motor is certainly something uh, uh, that uh, that is not going to be, uh, you know, some, uh, not, not going to be a joke. I mean, you're riding with a pillion with... Uh, uh, all your luggage and all of that in that 50 liter space that they're offering. I think it's a, uh, it's a very nice, uh, output to have. And like I said, three I think it's battery a packs. Uh, output road. That's that, that output is absolutely brilliant. 50 Newton is a fair, is a substantially large amount of torque to have in a scooter of that order. But exactly. here's the flip side, uh, here's the flip side and I'm coming in, uh, in a, with a bit of a negative over here, uh, for, a, for a pack like this, for a, for a full, uh, for a full offering of this sort you know, with uh, such a large uh, with a larger engine capacity and with the uh, higher battery with the higher range which means uh, much more powerful batteries and all of this including including the, the high top rating uh it's going to increase the price of this scooter in the indian market uh, substantially and from what we're seeing right now especially the well-branded ones these are not cheap they're upwards of a lack of rupees for these scooters for evs uh so you know uh the Eta Go is definitely going to be at a more affordable end of the market, even if Foda has to bring this over here. Uh, what I do expect to see is something uh, similar to what uh, Revolt uh, and Micromax what, uh, we did with the uh, Revolt, uh, where uh, the uh, subscription model came into play. So I think right. that would be a far more, uh, you know, uh, effective option to offer to consumers, uh, more of a subscription model rather than outright purchase. Because the way I look at it is you're looking at a scooter that's upwards, if not close to the 2 lakh rupee mark. Uh, and that's a fair amount of money for someone to be spending on a scooter. True. But consider the fact that Ola has got an extremely strong network around the country, has got uh, uh, well, uh, has got a fantastic brand presence as well. Uh, it makes a lot more sense to start off a subscription model uh, right. rather than you know, sell the motorcycle, sell, sell the scooters outright. Sell, sell the scooter. uh, right. So a last mile uh, solution would make a lot more sense in this case. Because uh, that yeah, is where we is where we're headed towards, and uh, you know, scooters sort of this will make a lot more sense for Ola uh, when we step into the market. Uh, on that note, also there's a lot of people who are asking us questions, and some of them are asking us if we're going to be answering viewer questions. Well, uh, not. I think we can take that now. Uh, we, we can, can take, take a few questions. viewer questions yeah. on the topics that we've discussed today. Uh, we've uh, we've covered all the news that happened uh, through the week. In fact, uh, uh, so uh, we've we also not. Uh, yeah, I think what we've not uh, mentioned, of course, was uh, Nissan and uh, Renault and. The the developments over there i think we should uh, we can definitely touch upon those and yes. essentially in sound the large press conference globally where uh, they said they are going to be consolidating their businesses focusing on certain uh, regions and letting go of others which means they're going to be stopping uh, production in certain plants around the world uh they're going to reduce their uh, their footprint uh, in terms of products that they're offering globally and uh, of course making some changes in uh, the number of people who will be working with them uh, and the facilities and markets around the world uh, this also right. aligns with what the alliance is planning which is the Renault Mitsubishi and Nissan alliance and uh, they right. will eff effectively also what they're basically doing is splitting the markets between themselves between Renault between Nissan between Mitsubishi and giving them each giving each of them focus areas uh, to develop uh, their, some of the products in the future for and as well as to invest in those markets and uh, you know, increase their presence in those markets uh, yeah, right. The focus, of course, is going to be a lot on electrics and electric hybrid vehicles and going forward uh, to 
feature with the uh, feature propulsion technology for that matter. So uh, in that sense, uh, they're getting prepared for that. Now, India has not been mentioned under any of these plans, neither in the you know, Nissan uh, Mitsubishi Alliance uh, conference that took place or the Nissan conference that took place. Uh, but uh, so we are not uh, we're not sure about what is going to be happening in that regard and whether uh, uh, Nissan stays put and continues to offer it in India for the long term or what's exactly going on with it's a little it's a little undecided at this point in time right uh, yes there's 12 products and all of that and we've seen uh, Nissan recently you know spoke about getting a small uh, compact SUV uh, for the for the Indian market uh, all of those plans are definitely online what I can say at this point in time is that uh, the company is here to stay there have been several investments made there is a huge potential for uh, Nissan as well as for Renault uh, in India so there are plans, uh, there are products as well in the pipeline, and uh, these will be fulfilled. So I don't think there's any fear in that uh, regard. Uh, Shaurya Anand Singh, for instance, asked Nissan is going to bring 12 new models, any news, how many of them will make it to India? Uh, there are going to be a few of these products that are going to be coming down to India as well, yes. Shaurya. Uh, and uh, what effectively they're going to be preparing or prepping for uh, is to improve the EV infrastructure within the country so that some of these cars uh, will effectively, uh, you know, will have uh, will have a network ready to, you know, uh, to be serviced on, ready to be ready to provide the service that is needed for consumers. So, in that sense, I think uh, there is preparation. The Sun will, uh, the Sun, uh, you know, definitely have plans and will continue uh, to offer the services in in, in India. I think uh, there's not much more to read into that at this point in time, and details will come along our way uh, over a period of time uh, as these right. filter down to regional markets and things like that. Uh, in fact, uh, to add to that, uh, what, what Nissan has been planning uh, for some time now, Nissan, Renault, both, uh, if you look at uh, cars like the Capture and the Kicks, now they are not exactly similar to what is sold in, in Europe. And I'm not talking purely about the specs, but also about the platform. So it's literally a vehicle that looks like the Capture that is sold in Europe or a vehicle that uh, looks like uh, the, the Kicks that is sold uh, in the global markets. But the vehicle that you get here is based on the Terrano or the Duster, which is a different platform altogether. So while it looks the same, the underpinnings are different, the engine options are different, the specs on offer are different, the features on offer are different, the way they drive is also different. Now, if you were to drive a European capture or a Kicks, it almost feels like something like the S-Cross. It almost feels like a hatchback. It's that easy to drive. It feels like a very easy to drive crossover. Whereas what you have in India feels more robust, feels more like an SUV. So there is a, a, a fair distinction between the two. But why Nissan is doing that is to essentially uh, make a low-cost engineered platform with a top hat that looks up to the times with what they have uh, in the European market. So we hear that Nissan has been working on a similar strategy with the Micra and the Sunny as well. Uh, so Sunny, I'm not too sure about, but the Micra is something that they're definitely looking at. Uh, they're looking at bringing the new edgy design that we saw in the European market down to the uh, Indian market as well. But again, based on uh, the outgoing Micra or maybe uh, even based on... Uh, the platform, the modular platform that underpins the likes of the Quid and the Triber. So they are evaluating all those options. Rather, they were evaluating all those options about two years ago. I'm hoping that uh, you know they've they've progressed further and uh, there is uh, uh, something that will uh, happen to that end. But again, the news that has come out yesterday, like Bert mentioned, where uh, they are sort of realigning a lot of strategies, uh, probably shutting down a few plants around the globe given the current slowdown. Uh, I don't know where uh, the current state of uh, these uh, plans and these uh, strategies is with respect to India. But that is what they were planning. And like you said, uh, there are 12 new models that Nissan is looking globally, some of which might make sense for India, but they'll have to follow this route if they have to keep the pricing competitive. You've seen it from all the European brands that uh, keeping the pricing competitive with the local brands, with the likes of uh, Maruti Suzuki, Hyundai, and now even Kia, it's a very difficult game. And it's not something that everyone will be able to do. And uh, that is something that Nissan uh, will have to look at uh, when they're planning models for the Indian market. All right, let's take another question. Uh, another thought has a question. Uh, is the Skoda Rapid Rider worth it, Rohit? And uh, Skoda service versus the Maruti service. People call Skoda have bad resale values and many bargains beyond the 7.49x showroom price. Uh, well, I'll, uh, I'll I'll come to the is is the Skoda Rapid Rider worth it? Uh, it is it is worth it. I'd, uh, but I'll let Rohit take that part. But I'll let me tell you about Skoda service and Maruti service. Uh, today in in the country, there is uh, there are very few who can come close to what Maruti has to offer in the service uh, at least aftermarket service. They have definitely established themselves as uh, as manuf as not just great manufacturers and only manufacturers of the highest order, but also as ones who deliver fantastic. Uh, aftermarket uh, experiences to their consumers 
and this is despite the kind of volumes that they manage and they maintain uh, you know in the country uh, and very few uh, very few manufacturers uh, have come and i'm talking about right down from the computer sectors all the way up to the premium and luxury sections as well very few have come close to what maruti has been able to deliver i think the closest if i had to say in terms of service would be toyota uh, and right. uh, i can't really think about too many others who uh, you know really uh, matched or able to match maruti on service quality level uh people call uh, people say skoda have bad resale and they don't think skoda has got bad resale value the products they come out with a fantastic products a solid durable products that matter uh resale value has never been an issue which skoda products have been able to uh, say value uh but uh, uh, uh having said that i mean the portfolio has never been really really large uh, from what i've seen is a lot of people also you know keep their skodas for a very long period of time they just uh, you know right. use them in ಮ್ಯಾನುಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಚರ್ leaderships about uh, discount for that matter simply because they've gone through a bad time they've gone through some very bad phases both the ps4 right. ps6 transition and then the lockdown it wouldn't be fair uh, for uh, you know for to anyone to get out to the market and try uh, to get discounts uh, if the dealer has some to offer you can that's fantastic uh, you know has off to those dealerships uh, very brave of them as well especially since they're managing large inventories and uh, you know a, a lot of people who are working for them they've managed so i think uh, discounts out of the question of discount and time coming to right. the rapid rider uh, uh, rohit what is your opinion again i think it's it's uh, very well priced uh, it's a very nice entry point like i said the previous one was priced at about 6.99 lakh rupees but the new one with the 1 liter tsi with the kind of output that it has and all of that i think yes. uh, it should i think it should be a very uh, nice buy i mean yes the vento and the rapid have been a little long in the two they've been around for quite some time but if you were to take a step back and really look at what they have to offer uh, apart from an aging design maybe uh now the rapid also has a newer design uh, that is that we've seen for the past couple of years or something and i think it looks really nice it's in line with what we've seen on the octavias and everything so yes the platform is aging but it doesn't really show that age all that much when you drive these cars uh, the kind of refinement that they offer the kind of build quality that they offer uh, i think they are still right up there they're still very competitive with what the competition has to offer and skoda has been uh slowly and steadily increasing the amount of features that are available and all of that and with all of that i think it's it's still a nice buy uh yes 7.49 lakh entry point it may not have all the bells and whistles but if you've uh, if you've wanted to look at something beyond the sub 4 meter category if you are not really up for a uh, a compromise sedan as i like to call the cs or the sub 4 meter sedans if you want something that looks balanced a proper three box sedan this is a very nice entry point uh, into into that world and uh, i think like i said it looks quite nice and now that uh, 110 ps uh, engine under the hood is certainly something that uh, that will put a smile on your face when you're driving it so i don't see a po- a problem with that and moving on to the bad resale that you've talked about i won't call it bad resale yes i will say the resale is not as strong as maybe a maruti suzuki or a hyundai but uh, you know no other brand really comes close uh, to that kind of a resale value it's purely down to the numbers uh the down to the number of vehicles that are being sold by these two brands and the amount of showrooms that they have which makes it easier to live with these vehicles because then uh you know uh, service spares all of that is very easily accessible and that is why over the years these brands have maintained a very very strong resale whereas the other brands don't match that strength that doesn't necessarily mean that they are bad uh, uh, at uh, the resale value that they are offering and like bert mentioned uh, you'll see a lot of skoda owners actually holding on to their vehicles beyond 5 years which is something that you will not see uh, probably with uh, with some of the other european brands or other japanese brands also for that matter so yes these vehicles do uh, withstand the test of time uh, we have seen we have uh, seen a lot of examples uh, where you are probably coming from is uh, the lack of spares or lack of availability for certain spares or certain limited editions that have that may have come out but all that has been ironed out now in fact uh, one of the biggest focus points for skoda and volkswagen in india for the past 4 5 years has been uh, uh, ha- you know having that strong uh, service network having a robust service network and also being accessible to the customer if they have any grievances uh, with the way the car is being handled in terms of the service and all of that 
and it's all sort of a related uh, cycle. If the service is good, then uh, the used car market is also uh, slightly easier uh, for, for that particular car or that particular brand when the service is good. If the service is bad or the spares are too expensive, that is when the resale value starts getting affected. So yes, maybe five, 10 years ago, Skoda did go through that phase, but now things are changing. If you look at the, the uh, resale values of something like a Superb or even the Yeti that uh, we mentioned so many times in this video today, the resale values are still quite strong. Even for a lot of the resale value is quite strong. So going by all of that, no, I would not call it a bad resale value. Uh, I think it's just not as strong as a Maruti Suzuki. But uh, you could live a lot longer with these vehicles is what I believe after the various long-term tests that we've done with this vehicle and uh, various other cars in its, comp in its bracket. All right. We'll take one more question, uh, Rohit. Uh, S. Jagannath Jagan. This one is for you, actually, Rohit. My budget is uh, 1 lakh 50,000 rupees, sir. Which bike is best? Yamaha FZ250 or Suzuki Jigsaw F250? Tell me, sir. Okay. So the Jigsaw SF250, uh, very frankly, came very close to winning the Bike of the Year award. It is that good. It is beautiful. The engine refinement, the way it handles, it's beautiful. The only polarizing bit on that motorcycle is the design. If the design appeals to you, close your eyes and go for it, quite literally. Uh, because I don't like the design all that much. But if I had to choose between the two, I would buy the Jigsaw 250 in a heartbeat. Either the fared version or the naked version, whichever you like, whichever appeals to you. I think the naked version looks a lot better than the fared one. But that is the motorcycle that I would uh, I would go with. And uh, reliability-wise, I think both the motorcycles are on par. Service costs, spare costs, both of them are on par. It's down to the design. Uh, so choose what looks best to you. But in terms of refinement, in terms of the way it handles, I like the Suzuki platform better than what Yamaha has managed with the FZ250. All right. Uh, I, I think that's all that we have for the news this uh month did we, did we talk about ethos bounce uh that's the thing the scooter sharing no but there was uh, one more platform. news that our producer just told me about which is uh, the fact that uh the uh west uh, the suzu uh, no i'm sorry the bajaj chetak the chetak ev uh the deliveries have been delayed uh well that was sort of expected uh given the current market scenario uh and also that uh, Bajaj operates out of Pune, which has been a red zone for quite some time now. So business is not easy uh, for Bajaj and its allied brands like uh, the Chetak, the KTMs, the Husqvarna's. All of that is right now uh, literally at a standstill because of whatever is happening. Uh, so yes, it will take some time. Uh, I think uh, the deliveries are uh, delayed by a month or two, if I'm not wrong. Uh, but yes, the deliveries are uh, delayed. So if you have made a booking and if you have been waiting for this vehicle, you will have to wait a little longer. There is no technical just, reason uh, just, for it. It's just the situation currently that has stopped uh, Bajaj from uh, manufacturing these vehicles at the pace that they would have loved at. Uh, so there's no, uh, there are there were a few questions if there is some technical problem with the vehicle that has been identified, which, which is leading, uh, leading to a delays. No, it is just the current scenario that is leading uh, to these delays. So just exercise some patience, just hold on for a little longer. We waited, uh, you know, for two months. Things will just kind of streamline pretty soon. And uh, those who are waiting for the delivery should get it uh, soon enough. Right. All right. Uh, gentlemen, I think uh, that's all we've got for the news uh, this week. And uh, thank you for uh, being along with us. Thank you for listening. in, And, uh, you know, great that you asked us those questions. Uh, we will uh, see you back again next week on another uh, weekly news roundup. Uh, that's next week, Friday, by which time I hope uh, several more restrictions would have been lifted off and we'll have a few more liberties at hand uh, to go driving around, or at least riding. Yeah, yeah, fingers crossed, exactly. <laughs> uh, so let's, let's uh, see how it all goes. Right. All right. See you, Rohit. And, uh cool, I think.